Hi everyone, it's very good to see you. Welcome to St. Helens today. Particularly if it's your first time with us, it's great to, to have you here. Whether you're a Christian or whether you're looking in on things, it's brilliant that you can be with us. We meet like this every Tuesday and Thursday and very much hope you'll make this a regular slot in your diary. Before we kick off, let me draw our attention to a couple of things on the notice sheet there. If you happen to be around tomorrow evening, we've got Summerlink happening. Let me highly recommend these, these evenings. We're tackling famous passages in the Bible that often get overlooked as just for the kids, but they're really useful times tackling with what they're really all about. And also, if, you're, if you are relatively new and you'd like to join one of the small group Bible studies that happen here in the city, either morning, lunchtime, or evening, drop us a line. It'd be great to, to include you in those when they kick off in the, in the autumn. Today, we're continuing our series working through the New Testament book of 1 Thessalonians. It's a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a group of Christians who've just recently become Christians and the letter describes the key things that they need to know. They're living in a, in a city that's very different, very un, unaccommodating to the Christian message. So it's good for us to hear as well key things that we need to know if we want to know what it's like to follow the Lord Jesus in this city. The, the series is slightly different to, us, to usual in that we're, every week we're trying to include quite a bit of input from city, city workers to help us think through a bit more than usual the practical implications of what we're hearing. So today we're going to hear from, hopefully from Dave Bryden, Cassandra Stevenson and Joe Pan. Simon Johnson is going to come and read for us. He'll read from page 1188 from 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13. But before Simon reads for us, let me pray for our time together. Paul writes this, we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us in the Bible and in 1 Thessalonians. Please help us to hear it, not as the opinions of men, but as your living word. We pray that you would be at work in us. Please use this time to shape our convictions, our thinking and our actions so that we might be people who live lives ready for the return of the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Simon. Thank you. As Wes said, our reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 13, and you can find that on page 1188 in the Church Bibles. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'll be reading through to chapter 3, verse 13. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in new believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out, and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But God's wrath has come upon them at last. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavoured the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind in Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love, 
and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you for this reason, brothers. In all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we might see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Thanks very much, Simon. Please keep that passage open and also turn to the inside of the, the service sheet and you'll see a slightly crazy looking diagram that we're going to attempt to work through quickly before we hear from the three guys we're going to interview. Now the title for today's talk is The Endurance That Transforms Hardship. And Paul wants the Thessalonian Christians to carry on living and speaking for Jesus Christ, even though they are suffering and facing hardship. He wants them to endure. He wants them to keep going until either they die or Jesus returns. Take a look down at chapter three, verse eight. He says, for now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. Now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. Paul has been worried about the suffering that these Christians are facing. Because they are Christians, they're suffering, people are opposing them, persecuting them, and he's worried that that's gonna shake them. Take a look down at chapter three, verse two. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this, for when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it has come to pass. Now just turn to the, the sheet there and we'll think about a little bit more about what this problem is that Paul is worried about. So you see there that top box in the diagram? I've tried to represent what I think Paul is worried about with the Thessalonians. So they are suffering. And we know that they've suffered a lot of violent persecution, we don't know much about the details, but they've, they've, there's been a big riot where they live. They've been isolated. They're facing a lot, of, a lot of difficulties as Christians. And Paul is worried, probably worried that are they beginning to doubt? Are they beginning to question whether they've made the right choice in becoming Christians? Maybe they're worried, is God really on their side? Is it worth carrying on? And also, particularly, if you look down at chapter 3 and verse 5, you can see what he's particularly worried about. He says, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. So they're facing opposition. There's this chance Paul is worried about that they might be tempted to leave Jesus behind and go back, back to the world that they once lived in. That they might make decisions that are more acceptable to the world around them. They would duck the opportunity to keep speaking about Jesus to make it known that they're followers of Jesus, they would give up. Now, those of us who are Christians face the same, the same danger. Now, it'd be good to think through later on, if you get a chance, where you think there might be a danger of us not enduring, falling away when we face hardship. Some of us know the cost well of being Christians. We've been isolated perhaps by our family or at work. I was chatting to one guy yesterday who said he's invited stacks of people along to the lunchtime talks over the years and not, not one of them has shown really any interest in taking things further and that's discouraged him, made him question is it really true, that kind of thing. But some of us might say, well hang on a minute, we don't, we don't get persecuted here in, in the city, we're not really suffering, we're not the persecuted church, this isn't northern Nigeria or Syria. But I think it is worth seeing that Paul does think that this is a pattern that Christians will follow. If we follow Jesus Christ, we will suffer to some extent for following him. Maybe not in a physical and a violent way, 
but perhaps in perhaps a more subtle way, maybe that's even more dangerous. Again, worth thinking through yourself what this might involve, but perhaps we might step back from avoiding persecution and not really mentioning it because we're, not, we're worried about what people might say. Someone said to me yesterday, he thought the danger that we face is self-censorship, self-censorship. So we might moderate our choices, we might moderate what we say so we don't ruffle the feathers of those around us. But anyway, that is the issue, that opposition to the Christian message can cause hardship for those who follow Jesus Christ. And you might think, well, if you're looking in on Christian things, well, life is tough enough anyway, why would I want to add the hardship of, of suffering as a Christian on top of that? So how does Paul help these Thessalonians to keep going? How does he help them to endure? Well, what he's been doing in the first three chapters of, of this letter is telling them what it is he's thankful to God for them about, what he's praying for them, what it is he wants for them. And by doing that, he's explaining to them, he's showing them what the Christian life is all about. And he's trying to persuade them that even though it involves suffering, even though it involves being unpopular, it's still true, it's still worth it, it's still the right thing. It's God is at work in them. If you missed the, those talks, I'd recommend listening to them online. They're really, really excellent. I listened to them a couple of days ago. But what, today's talk, what about today's talk? And again, this title, Endurance That Transforms Hardship. It was Ollie that gave the first talk who came up with this title. And I must admit, it took me a while to understand what, what this means. I'm a little bit slow. But I think I've got it now. And I think it's a really useful, useful title. So let me try and illustrate it for us. Imagine you find yourself in an icy river at five o'clock in the morning in February and you feel, feel exhausted. What's more, you've got a group of people on a bridge above the river shouting abuse at you and throwing beer cans at you and you think, gosh, this is awful. What am I doing here? I've got to get out of this river as quick as possible and go somewhere warm. And that's the obvious thing to do, isn't it? You're experiencing suffering, you're experiencing hardship, you need to leave. But then as you start clambering out of the river, a bloke comes over to you and says, hey, what do you think you're doing? You're, you're here, you're training for the Olympics. You are doing really well, get back in the river. You can win a rowing gold medal if you keep going. Don't worry about those guys throwing the beer cans. They're, they won't hurt you. They're just guys paid by the Russian team to put you off. <laughs> and I've heard that they're gonna be banned anyway. So just get back in endure the suffering and encourage the other guys as well. They're your teammates, crack on with it. So suddenly your hardship, your suffering is transformed, isn't it? It's part of normal experience for training for the Olympics. It's still the same, you're still suffering the same thing, but now in its context with a bit of perspective, you're able to endure, you're able to transform that hardship and get on with it. And it's something like that that Paul wants for the Thessalonians in this passage. He wants them to understand the context, the perspective of the Christian life so that they will, they will put up with hardship, they will endure through it. They will understand it, they will transform it. Right, let's, let's go back to our diagram and dive in and see a little bit about what he says. So I've tried to represent here the Christian life that Paul sets out in, in this chunk. And we'll start with that middle box where it says number one, now this is how Paul fleshes out the Christian life. So they were suffering, they were facing opposition, but Paul now tells them a few more things about that they should know. So in chapter two, verse 13, he says, we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. So, big thing to notice, first of all, God is at work in you. You are not on your own. God is with you. They've begun well, they've listened to God, and God is at work in them. Second thing he wants them to know, that what is happening to them is perfectly normal. Did you see that? He goes on there in, I think it's verse 14, for you brothers became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and oppose 
all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. So he's saying suffering is actually part of the Christian life. It's what we can expect to happen now before Jesus returns. Later in the passage, he says, we told you this again and again, that we were to suffer. So if you're here, someone looking in on Christian things, I wonder if you've been told that. Have you been told that if you follow Jesus, you will suffer? But how does this help us? Well, it helps them and it helps us because it sets our expectations, doesn't it? It shows us that something hasn't gone wrong. It doesn't mean that God has left us. It doesn't mean that we've signed up, signed up to the wrong religion. We've always been told that there will be suffering. It, we shouldn't doubt. So again, it'd be good to spend a moment thinking, thinking that through. Where have you experienced su suffering because you're a Christian? In fact, the Christian's willingness to suffer is actually a mark that God is at work in them. So there we go, Paul has fleshed out a little bit of their understanding of the present. Let's move on to the right-hand box and see what he says about the future. Back in chapter one, verse 10, Paul described the Thessalonians' conversion like this. He said it is, you are waiting for the return of Jesus from heaven. You're waiting for Jesus to return. And again, in this passage, he emphasizes the future focus of the Christian life. Not a gold medal in Rio, but the return of Jesus. That is the Christian's goal. Did you notice what motivates Paul's concern for them in chapter 2, 19? He talks about the Thessalonians as his joy and his crown. The crown is the wreath that the athletes were given when they won, won a race or something like that. And Paul is saying, you are my gold medal. You are what I will be proud of when Jesus returns. And you, if you have time to look at the passage again, you'll see that Paul is not satisfied with the fact that he shared the gospel in Thessalonica. He's not even satisfied that he planted a church. He wanted to make sure they were still going, so he sent Timothy to encourage them, to exhort them to keep going. And then Timothy came back and said, yeah, they're doing really well. But he wasn't even satisfied with that. He said he prays night and day for them. He writes to them. He wants to fill up what is lacking in their, in their faith. He is really focused on making sure that they make it to the end. He's not just interested they start well, he wants them there at the end. That's what he is focused on. He wants them to endure. Why? Because Paul knows that that is, is the, the ultimate aim of the Christian life. It's not the here and now, but it's not the journey, it's the destination. So again, it'd be worth dwelling on that for a second if you get a chance. Is that our ambition for ourselves? Are we focused on the end? Let me read what he prays for them in chapter, chapter three, verse 11. He says, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Do you see it? His ambition is for their, what they, where they will be when Jesus returns. So is that your ambition for yourself? Is that your ambition for your children or your wife, your colleagues, whether they're Christian or not? Is, is that what you are focused on, that last day when Jesus returns? And then I guess that raises the question, what are we doing to help others, to help ourselves make it to the end? That brings us to the, just quickly to the arrow on the left-hand side there. What can we do to help others endure? Well, this is gonna be fleshed out in future weeks, so we don't need to say too much about it now, but it's worth noticing that Paul wants them to hear the word and he wants them to love one another like he has loved them. So what Paul has done is set out how much he cares for them so that they will imitate him and have the same ambitions for each other, the same attitude to each other. Just see that quickly in chapter three, verse 12. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. So as, as you see Paul's concern for them, that's what he wants them to have for one another. This love for each other that teaches them the word, teaches one another the word so that they will be endure, they will make it to the end. So just to sum up, what have we seen? Hardship, 
is a reality in the Christian life. If we're following the Lord Jesus, it will be a reality for us. It might not look exactly like it did for the Thessalonians, but it is normal, we should expect it. And it is dangerous, it can lead us astray, it can tempt us to give up, to look for easy options, look for a more comfortable life, and to walk away from Christ. But Paul wants us to endure to the end, to keep going to the end. The Christian life is about enduring through suffering until the end. That is the pattern, that is the, the Christian, Christian life. If we have endurance, if we have the right perspective, we will be able to transform the hardship that we face now. Okay, let's now haul up our three, three willing participants, Dave, Cassandra, and, and Joe. And I will ask them a few questions just to flesh out what this Christian pattern looks like in day-to-day -day life. Dave, you got up first, so let me start with you. Just tell us quickly how you got going as a Christian in the first place. Come and stand right up by the mic there. Uh, how I got started as a Christian? Well, uh, it was a long time ago, um, 1979 to be exact, I think. And um, my uh, background was that I was brought up with loving parents in a, I'd say, a very nominal Christian environment. And like a lot of people in my sort of fifth form, sixth form, I uh, went off the rails a bit and uh, started you know, the usual sort of thing, I suppose, of parties, rock concerts, and all that sort of thing, wearing flares. Yeah, <laughs> sort of yeah. It's hard to imagine, but I actually dressed like a hippie. I know that might seem a bit strange looking at me now, but uh, yeah. And uh, that's what my life seemed to consist of, going to rock concerts, parties. I mean, I worked hard, played hard, got to university at Nottingham and enjoyed some time there. And uh, yeah, just carried on living like that really. And it was a pretty godless lifestyle. And uh, it wasn't until I actually started on the uh, Royal Insurance, as it then was, Royal Insurance Graduate uh, Training Programme uh, in Croydon. I uh, did a two year stint there before coming up to the city. But um, a lot of people become a Christian at university, but it was for me, it was afterwards. And um, uh, I, was, I remember used to every Monday morning meet this girl as part of the training and, uh, that we were doing. And uh, she would tell me about her youth group and what she did at the weekend with this Christian youth group. And it all sounded so wholesome and good and different to what I was doing. And I was just at that point, I think, where I got fed up with hangovers and the lifestyle that I was living. Um, and uh, I just realized that I think my life was at a, a crossroads and uh, I just I'd finished a long-term relationship and I remember thinking at the time you know so is this it now I've joined Royal Insurance is this <laughs> is this how it's going to be isn't there more to life and I'd never really thought about history or about where we come from or anything like that but for some reason I can only put that down to the Lord's working in my heart but I started to I bought a book called the history of civilization really bizarre behavior and uh, and then I remember saying to this girl that she was saying about her youth group it was an unusual youth group because it had about it was focused at people from 18 to in their 20s and I said would you mind if I come to your youth group and I really had to pluck up courage to ask her to do it but she, I think she said she nearly fell off her chair when I asked, when I asked her but that was the start of um, me going to a church youth group and of course they challenged me what do you think about God hadn't got a clue didn't know what the difference was between the Old Testament and the New Testament and uh, so I started investigating the claims of Christianity for myself and I have to say as I read the Bible for myself did one-to-ones things like that um, the Christian worldview started to make sense to me and uh, I really started to learn what God was all about and that he loved me but the thing that really turned it for me I think the, the talk that I remember having or listening to uh, back in 1979 was a guy who did a talk on the reality of evil and the fact that evil is 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 a, is is in our in this world and it's something that we need to deal with and it was at that point I realized that there are only two camps spiritually you're either on God's side or Satan's side and I realized I was in the wrong camp so I went home and committed my life to the Lord thanks Dave so that was 50 years ago you said 40 years ago 37 sorry. 37 <laughs> so just tell us 
we see, see in this passage that the Christian will face affliction. Any examples of that in the city? Just really quickly. Okay, just very quickly. I mean, I, I've always think, I think it's always important to make uh, it clear to people, to my work colleagues, that I am a Christian. I've sought to do that whatever job I've done in RSA insurance. But, uh, and I've invited many people along here, done a few Bible studies with different people. And... Uh, and that's, that's been encouraging, but I suppose the backdrop is that most people uh, are, are less than interested. And I think, I do find it hard, even now, even though I've brought many people along, to, to bear witness to the Lord and to invite people. It is hard. I think I fear the rejection. And there is a quiet sort of, quiet disengagement or disinterest with what I stand for. And I am conscious that... You know, I am different to most of the people in my team. And uh, you, you have to put up with, I think, a little bit of, they want to get on and do th things certain ways, and you are excluded. But that's life, I think, as a Christian. And I don't think I've suffered, obviously, like, you know, we see here perhaps with the Thessalonian Christians. But it's, it, as I'm sure we all know, it's not always easy to stand up front as a Christian in the workplace. Great, thanks Dave. Cassandra, can I ask you the same, same question? Any, any examples in the city where you face some form of opposition or affliction? And just tell us a bit about what impact that's had on you. Yeah, so I think, um, I think for me, um, I'm fortunate that I haven't actually suffered any real hard persecution, but I would say um, there's definitely a social cost. Um, just being left out or ostracized or not invited to something. Um, there's also a bit of, I think for me as well, like, um, pride gets mixed into it, you know, not being treated the same or an equal or be considered just as smart as somebody else. Um, I think those are, that's how affliction probably um, shapes up. And it can be more severe. Um, there can be definitely negative consequences professionally as well as um, socially. Um, and what impact does that have on you as a Christian? Does it make you doubt or question what? Yeah, no, so I don't really, um, I don't ever really doubt the veracity of the gospel or, or what's in the Bible, but um, I think it, I mean, it, I'm human as well. It does hurt, right, when, um, when I, I do suffer affliction, and it's, um, it can be hard. And also, you know, you, sometimes I think uh, maybe it's not worth it, or maybe I should stand down or not really stick up for what I really believe in. And, um, Sometimes I need to rethink about why I'm here and wh how um, God has been gracious to me, and um, maybe it is worth it. Yeah. Thanks, Cassandra. That's really useful. Joe, can I ask you a couple of questions? <coughs> this is Joe, Joe Pan. Joe is just about in a week or so, or a couple of weeks' time, going to head off to, to Beijing. So I thought it would be good to hear from Joe just before he goes. Joe, tell us how Chinese Christians, both here in London perhaps and in, and in Beijing, are facing affliction and what impact that has on them their walk with the Lord. Thanks Wes. Uh, just to give you a bit of background, for the past four Easter's or so, we've taken a team of Christians from the city to go out to Beijing to learn from and to support uh, Christians in the financial district in Beijing. Um, one of the things that we hear a lot from Christians in China is just family pressure, and that affects their whole life. So let's say you're a young single uh, Christian guy, you've gone back to China, you've, you're looking for jobs. There's a lot of family factors that are going through your mind. I, in a, in a country where they don't really have a proper pension system, your responsibility is you have to look after your parents when they retire. So you're thinking, can I get the best paid job possible in order to honor them? You're also thinking, if I wanna get married, well, any potential sh uh, girl that I want to get married to, their family is gonna ask, has he got a house? Has he got a car? What kind of job has he got? So I'm gonna think about that and I don't want my parents to lose face because I didn't get married. And so there's all those sorts of factors playing into a Christian's mind, which means that they end up probably taking jobs which are really busy, high pressured, and stops them being able to go to church and listening to God's words, engaging with, with other Christians. Within the workplace itself, I think, the Christians who have it the toughest are the ones who work for state-owned enterprises or companies where many of the employees are Communist Party members. Um, I'll give you one example. There's a little group um, of Christians who meet every Wednesday lunchtime. Um, they're made up of Christians from different organizations, but they're all state-owned. And a couple of years ago, I went along to visit them and they had lunch together. I expect them, expected them to get the Bible out or to pray together, but they didn't do that. And I asked the group leader, how come 
you didn't read the Bible or you didn't pray together. He said, well, look around you. There's lots of people in this restaurant. They might be our clients and we don't want any of them to find out that we're Christians. Because if they do, that will lose the contracts. It will be bad for the company. Uh, we might definitely lose our jobs. And so they feel real, real pressure to just to keep quiet and not tell anybody about their faith. So just tell us, Joe, why are you going to Beijing? Um, well, one, one big thing is, is it's great to learn from Christians out there. Um, I, I said here on Sunday morning that it's good to learn from the fact that Christians in, in Beijing are often joyful in their affliction. They, uh, they are happy to suffer for, for the Lord. And whereas here, I think I, I find myself wanting to avoid suffering as much as possible. Whereas they, they can't avoid it, but they're, they're still joyful in the Lord. It's a great thing to learn from them. And just the general enthusiasm for the gospel. I think like the Christians uh, in Thessalonica, a lot of them are not that mature as Christians or well taught as Christians. Yet they have this enthusiasm to serve the Lord that their ministry that God's given them is on their mind all the time. They meet up all the time to pray together for their colleagues, to talk about how we're going to get the gospel out to, to, to our colleagues. And I think that's a great thing for us to learn. Um, it might hopefully uh, uh, under God it, the, hopefully we can go out and, um, and support them as well I think in China there's a lot of people becoming Christians um, but people don't have access to good teaching I think and that it leaves them exposed to false teaching false gospels um, and one of the big prayers is that we can go out there and hopefully teach the word faithfully and train others to be able to do that um, and hopefully that will help them to endure. Brilliant. Thanks, Joe. Cassandra, can I give the last, last word to you? Just tell us how this, what Paul says in this passage helps you endure as a Christian in the city. Any thoughts on that to get us, get us thinking as we yeah. chat over lunch? Yeah, so um, I think for me, um, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, where, it talk, um, where he says that, um, do not be moved by these afflictions and basically to anticipate them because they are they are reality for being a Christian um, I think uh, personally I find it kind of comforting to actually be told that um, to expect expect difficulties that life is not going to be easy as a Christian um, because it does make it normal as as Wes mentioned um, it also is is helpful to remember that there is that God has given us many promises that there is a future if you are a Christian um, and everything will be okay in the end that it will be a much better place once um, once Christ comes back so um, it actually means that enduring is a lot easier um, in the sense that I know there's there's an end to it and it and um, and it makes everything okay t I think today so um, yeah brilliant thank you very much Cassandra That's, thanks guys really useful let me um, close in prayer and also there's a few questions on the back there if you want to chat through over your sandwich or as you walk back through the rain let me pray pray for us well Paul says this now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen. Thanks for coming along.